Light is commonly emitted in several ways. We've discussed atomic excitation in the previous lessons. Now let's discuss other ways in which light is emitted by incandescence, fluorescence, and phosphorescence. The common light bulb developed by Edison, although being phased out, illustrates the phenomenon of incandescence, from a Latin word meaning to grow hot. Light produced as a result of high temperature is called incandescent light. The light can have a reddish tint, as from the heating element of a toaster, or a bluish tint, as from a particularly hot star. Or it can be white, as from the familiar incandescent light bulb. What sets incandescent light apart from the light of excited gases in advertising signs is that it contains an infinite number of frequencies spread smoothly across the spectrum. Does this mean that an infinite number of energy levels characterize the tungsten atoms making up the filament of an incandescent light bulb? The answer is no. If the filament were vaporized and then excited, the tungsten gas would emit light with a finite number of frequencies and produce an overall bluish color. Light emitted by atoms far from one another in the gaseous phase is quite different from the light emitted by the same atoms closely packed in the solid phase. This is analogous to the difference in sound from isolated ringing bells and from a box crammed filled with ringing bells. In a gas, the atoms are far apart. Electrons undergo transitions between energy levels within the atom quite unaffected by the presence of neighboring atoms. But when the atoms are closely packed in the solid, electrons of the outer orbits make transitions not only within the energy levels of the parent atoms, but also between the levels of neighboring atoms. They bounce around over dimensions larger than a single atom, resulting in an infinite variety of transitions, hence the infinite number of frequencies of radiated energy. Incandescence depends on temperature, a form of thermal radiation. This is a plot of radiated energy over a wide range of frequencies for two different temperatures of an incandescent solid. With increasing temperature, more high-energy transitions occur and higher-frequency radiation is emitted. The curve comprises what is called a continuous spectrum. In the brightest part of the spectrum, the predominant frequency of emitted radiation, the peak frequency, is directly proportional to the absolute temperature of the emitter. We've discussed this physics in previous screencasts, particularly for radiant energy. Recall that the bar above the F indicates peak frequency, for radiations of many frequencies are emitted from an incandescent source. Since violet light has nearly twice the frequency of red light, we therefore know that a violet hot star has nearly twice the surface temperature in kelvins of a red hot star. The temperature of incandescent bodies, whether they be stars or blast furnace interiors, can be determined by measuring the peak frequency or color of the radiant energy they emit. Moving on to fluorescence, we pick up on atomic excitation of the previous lesson. We'll return to fluorescent lamps in the next lesson. Recall how atoms are excited when bombarded with high-speed particles. It so happens that an atom may be excited by absorbing a photon of light. That's right, excited by light. From the relationship, E equals HF. Note that higher frequency light, such as ultraviolet, delivers more energy per photon than lower frequency light. Some substances, when illuminated with ultraviolet light, undergo excitation and emit visible light upon de-excitation. This process is called fluorescence. In these materials, a photon of ultraviolet light boosts an electron to a higher energy state leapfrogging over several intermediate energy states. So when the atom de-excites, it may make smaller jumps emitting photons with less energy. This excitation and de-excitation process is like leaping up a small staircase in a single bound and then descending one or two steps at a time rather than leaping all the way down in a single bound. Photons of lower frequency are emitted hence the variety of characteristic colors of the material. Look how these crayons glow when illuminated with an ultraviolet lamp. 
Visit the geology section of a natural history museum and take in the exhibit of minerals illuminated with ultraviolet light. You'll see a variety of glowing colors from minerals composed of a variety of elements. If you're with a friend, discuss the relationship between the colors and the variety of energy levels in the minerals. Doesn't this knowledge add to their beauty? I hope so. Beauty is in both the mind and the eye of the beholder. I know how some minerals fluoresce from personal experience. Years ago, when I was prospecting for uranium in Colorado, I also prospected for scheelite, an ore of tungsten, quite valuable. It was a nighttime activity with a portable ultraviolet lamp called a blacklight. This is what scheelite looks like when illuminated with ultraviolet. I never found much scheelite, but what I did discover was that scorpions are fluorescent. So a scheelite glow that moved wasn't scheelite. Ultraviolet light isn't necessary for many fluorescent objects. This yarn, for example, has fluorescent dyes in it to make it glow by ultraviolet photons in sunlight. So its vivid brightness is enhanced with some fluorescence. A close cousin to fluorescence is phosphorescence, like fluorescence with an afterglow. At the left is some powder in a plastic bottle. We shine ultraviolet light on it in a dark room, and when the source of light is removed, on the right we see the powder glows in the dark. The powder has been excited by ultraviolet, but some of the electrons, when boosted to higher energy levels, become stuck. Hence, there's a time delay before de-excitation occurs, sometimes as long as several hours, although most materials de-excite rather quickly. Here's some phosphorescent pigment that provides extended afterglows for general use in paints, plastics, inks, and security applications. The process of excitation and de-excitation producing this afterglow is called phosphorescence or even a case for your mobile phone. Many living creatures, from bacteria to fireflies and larger animals, such as jellyfish, chemically excite molecules in their bodies that emit light. We say that such living things are bioluminescent. Bioluminescence is common in sea creatures, some creating a sort of deep sea fireworks. We can compare three kinds of light emission, excitation, fluorescence, and phosphorescence, with the analogy of kicking a ball out of a hole. If Phil Physiker kicks a ball to the top of a hole, which then returns in one jump, we have excitation. If Phil's ball, upon reaching the top, returns with a bounce or more on the way down, we have fluorescence. If Phil's ball upon reaching the top returns and part way down becomes stuck for a while, we have phosphorescence. Light emission is yum physics. I want to leave you with a question. Why would it be impossible for a fluorescent material to emit ultraviolet light when illuminated by infrared light? Until next time. Good energy.